So this is going to be a fun episode of the Elite Recruiter Podcast. I have my special guest and good friend, Scott Love, with me today. And one of the reasons why I'm excited about having Scott Love talk is because he is such a good coach on helping bring out the best as, as you are in recruiter. So what we're going to talk about is bringing out your full potential and what keeps recruiters from achieving their full potential as a recruiter. But on top of that, like Scott is actually back in the coaching chair again with the placement club. So excited to see all the fun things that he's going to share, help level up the entire community. And also just for, there's a special link in the show notes to sign up for the placement club if you definitely want to be a part of it. So Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Ben. I'm excited to be here. This is great. So I know we normally talk about like how you got started in recruiting. I, I, we have that on another episode. So if you want to make it short and sweet so we can get into the good, the good stuff. Yeah. Just like everybody, I fell into it. I got out of the Navy and, uh, I liked the Navy experience. It was great. And I got into sales, commission only sales and the office next to ours, I was selling telecom at the time. They were a recruiting firm. I would hang out in their office during lunch. And they said, if you get really good at recruiting, you can make over $40,000 a year. And I thought I'm never going to have an opportunity like that. And so I did. And I joined them and I did okay. I moved away. I was supposed to still be working for them. I moved away and was working virtually. And the owner of the firm uh, didn't pay me commissions. And so I, I, think I, I think I quit. I'm not sure. I didn't even know it was an industry. I hung out my own shingle, literally folding card table in a one-bedroom apartment, honored my non-compete, and the rest is history. And I've been in it. And Ben, I'll be honest, I've tried to quit this business for years. I've tried to quit, but it just it's just like the game of golf. One good shot brings you back in to that wicked sport. It's the same thing with recruiting also. And uh, I love it. I mean, just admitting that I love the grind. I love the work. It's uh, I really, it's very satisfying and very fulfilling. I, I think it's crazy that like you, back then, the pitch was you could maybe make 40K and you've had multiple years, like over seven figures. I've been grateful. And honestly, I just feel like I get lucky. I mean, I just happen to call someone. I happen to have a client that happens to fit and they like each other and they pay me on time. So, well, I, yeah. I will say this. I have seen your work ethic over the years. And uh, for those that uh, don't know, me and Scott actually now live pretty close to each other. So we've gotten a chance to hang out. And, you know, with the work ethic, you know, that, that luck just kind of happens. It happens a little so. more often. <laughs> But honestly, I just feel lucky, Ben. I mean, I really, I really do. So. So, so before we do a deep dive uh, into reaching your full potential as a recruiter, mm -hmm. uh, talk about the Placement Club. Yeah, I, I had a similar version of it. So the Placement Club, it's a free community. We've got free resources, over 20 hours of content on there every other week. And sometimes even more frequently, I'll do a free 15-minute recruiting workshop. One good idea can change your life forever. And all those are archived and saved, and that's absolutely free. And then I do a weekly group coaching program because I don't have the time to coach a bunch of people one-on-one. -on -one. It interests me a little bit, but I like solving problems and math where you sign up for that every Monday at one o'clock Eastern. We do that. And I, I go into deep learning on certain variables that are critically important to people achieving success. And it's mostly geared towards intermediate and advanced recruiters. And the premise is this. Many times they don't need more training. Do you know how to make a placement? Yes. Well, how come you're not doing more of that? There's a reason why. And those are the things that I've covered. And that comes from me having coached so many people. Because I started my training business, Ben, back in 2002. I don't even think you were born yet back then. I started my, my training business back then and then sold it in 2016 because I like doing deals. But since that time, I've missed helping people. I'd gone to some conferences. I'm a member of Sanford Rose. I spoke at their conference last year, a lot of people came up and said, hey, thanks to you and your dorky YouTube channel, I learned how to become a big biller. Thank you. And I, and I liked that. And I realized, you know, I like helping other people. I like sharing. Listen, let me save you 20 years. Don't do that. Do this. Wow. Thank you. You just saved me 20 years. I like that. And so I wanted to put something together that didn't cost a lot, the price of a nice dinner. You can cancel at any time if you're not getting value. I don't want to keep people to something that's just not giving them value over the long term. If they want to cancel, that's fine. But I want to give overwhelming value. Basically, we play a game. You pay me $100, I give you tens of thousands of dollars back. That's the whole premise of that. So I like doing it. And I like the fact that 
you know, I'm, I'm taking time away from my deals for about an hour or two a week, but it's doing deals. That's what, that's what I get really excited about. And it motivates me. And it's just the a placement is the fruition of disciplined, focused effort in the service of other people. And I like that. I like, like I said, it's a grind, but the grind can be a joy, I think. And so I'll have a special link for the placement club in the show notes. So definitely go down to the show notes, click it, join the club. I'm actually part of it myself. <laughs> All right, Scott. And, uh, you know, one caveat, I'm actually turning 40 this month. So. Okay, good. You, catching up, catching up, <laughs> catching up, you know. Wasn't quite recruiting yet when you started the training. I actually, <laughs> if you want to go laugh, I think I started recruiting four years later after you started your training program. Oh, is that right? Okay, good, good. That's great. Yeah. yeah I've been in it for a, a while myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. It's good to get some time in where you know which way to duck when problems come along and things just don't bother you as much. So that's good. Good for Awesome. You. So, all right, here's what I'm excited about. Scott, what keeps recruiters from reaching their full potential? Oh, I think, number one, it's self-esteem. I think that, uh, and, and I've done this in seminars that I've done, and I may do some in the future again, but uh, I would hold them in Las Vegas, and we get maybe 40, 50 people there, and it would be a two-day thing, and I would talk about limiting beliefs. I would say that, do you know how to get a candidate? Yes. Do you know how to get a client? Yes. Do you know how to put them together and make a place? Yes then what is it? There's something beyond training that's keeping people from being massively successful. And I would ask them to identify their ultimate career billing goal. If you are able to work at a peak level every hour of every day for a year, and your relationships are healthy, and you're not going to feel burned out, what are you truly capable of? And so I would have them define that vision. And I don't, it's not all about the money, but that's how we measure it. That's how we define it. It's not all about the money. And I don't think that should be the motivator. I don't think it is, but that's the measurement. So start with that. What's your ultimate career building goal? And then I would have them get a separate sheet of paper and I would say, you know what it is that's keeping you from reaching that. And I want you to write it on a sheet of paper. Just pull it out of your notebook, tear it out, write it on there. And I would have them do this. I would say, I want you to take it and I want you to fold it and fold it in half again and then tear it up. And you're making a decision to choose not to let that limiting belief control you. And some people would tell me they would take these pieces of paper back home and they would burn them. And that was a pivotal moment for them. And how do I know that works? Because that's what I did. It was low self-esteem. I think that's it. It's, do you, what is your relationship with money like? When I grew up as a kid, money is evil. The rich, and I remember my dad, bless his heart. We're poor son, but we're proud. We're always going to be poor, but we're always going to be proud. And I remember thinking, I don't know. I think I want something different. And I found, gosh, I'm guilty. I'm, I'm feeling guilty when I made all this money. All I did was just send an email. No, there's more to it than that. But I realized that wealth, is a representation of the amount of value you provide to other people. And that helped me anchor my feelings about money, that it's not being a greedy, greedy, selfish, rich person. It's an over, overwhelming service to other people that benefits them. And so I think it's people's self-esteem. Uh, there is a, I remember this is a critical uh, book for me that I read, and I've read a lot, and I read every day. And years ago, I was in a bookstore. I was in the business section. And I found a book on how to overcome self-sabotage. And the name of the book was called How to Overcome Self-Sabotage, <laughs> written by Pat Pearson. And I read and I found it. I thought it was interesting. It was in the business section. And I realized that was it. I'm hesitating. I'm delaying and getting back to people. I'm not asking those hard questions because I'm afraid of success. I had a person that worked for me years ago, and he'd never done recruiting. He'd never done sales before. Uh, he came out of the construction industry, which at that time was my niche. And he told me, and this is before I had my training business. He said, I'm going to do everything you tell me to do. I'm not going to question it, and I'm going to do it. And in his first 12 months, he billed $300,000. Now, that's a lot of money now. That was a lot of money back in 2000. And the next six months, 
He had several deals that didn't close. He billed zero in six months. And that's when I learned how to do deal autopsies, which is something I've taught people. And we would do deal autopsies on each of those. And each reason, each deal's reason for not closing was something that he either did do that he shouldn't have done or something he didn't do that he should have done. It was all within his control. And there were little inflection points in each deal where this didn't happen, so the deal fell apart. And I believe the reason was he didn't see his financial self-worth going over $70,000 a year because he'd never made that much before. There's a book that Harv Ecker wrote. I can't remember what it's called. It's The Millionaire Something, but the book is a, a good book in that it explains that concept of a financial thermostat, that if you feel that you're worth less than a certain amount, then you're not going to do what it takes to get over it. And as soon as you start getting over that, you're going to sabotage yourself. So I think in a nutshell, Ben, I think that's what I've seen. And just to give some perspective, when I had my training company, I mean, it was a hardcore training company. I had videos, I had books, CDs, then online learning, over 4,500 recruiting and staffing companies from 36 countries. It was global, invested in my resources. I've been in over 150, 125, 150 recruiting offices doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with their team over the years. And I've coached a lot of people and I've seen that's it. It's not the skill. It's not the knowledge. It's do you feel like you deserve it? And I'd gone through that, through that journey, Ben. I've been there. And I had to deal with the conflict. Oh, God, I want to make the money, but what am I doing? And then, and I've seen other people who I just have so much respect for that I've coached, that have risen up, that have done the work. And their self-esteem increases. And it's a skill. I think anybody can learn it. It's a skill. You're not gifted with high self-esteem. I think we're all born in the same, in the world the same way, upside down and naked. You know, that's it. And everything else happens after that. But I think that's it. And that's what my commitment is, is to help people reach their full potential. And I like that. I really, I really like that. I feel like, uh, you know, with the placement club, that's something that'll be my retirement business when I stop sparring with lawyers all day as a legal recruiter. You know, that's what I'll do in between painting pictures of Western scenes at my gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico. <laughs> so that's so because I can do that for a couple hours a week. Right. Uh, but but that's what I love is just helping recruiters break through that and uh, just achieve, overcome and break through. So. You figured it, you figured that out. Was there a point in time where it just hits you and what were you going through when you realized like I have been self-sabotaging myself? I would say yes and a journey where I think that there's a little bit of self-destruction in all of us. And I've been through a lot. I've been through when I was uh, at the Naval Academy. I wanted to be a Navy pilot. I had migraines. They said, you're not going to do it. And I got self-destructive. Uh, when I had to go to a ship, I had a bad attitude. But when I started enjoying the sailoring part of it, the headaches got worse. We're going to separate you. I know I'll go to law school. I'll be a Navy Jack. Sorry, we've got a reduction in force anyways. See you later. Self-destructive. And I think I didn't learn until years later that we can choose our response to adversity. And through my training business years ago, I would teach people techniques, tactics of building resilience muscles. So it gets easier every time. Um, I think we all fall into that. I think a spiritual walk is a way to help people with that by looking at the world as a spiritual thing. And that's just my own belief. Through the, for me, it's the, through the Episcopal tradition. But I think looking at the lens, looking at the world through that lens, we're never going to be perfect. There's always something to learn. So I think for me, the pivotal moment was in that bookstore. But then even recently, and this is something that I've talked about recently with people on the placement club is that I document every day four different things, my submissions, my send outs. So two key performance indicators. And then another column on an Excel spreadsheet is what was the thing that I did really well? What was my greatest achievement for the day? I document that. And then the other one, this is the real learning, Ben. What was the lesson that I learned? And so every day since 2017, I've been documenting this and I found that every Six weeks or so, I'm going to go back through the lessons learned call and I'm looking for trends. And I'm looking at why is that trend happening? And so here's an example about three years ago, or actually pre-COVID, pre-COVID. I keep forgetting that was three years ago. Pre-COVID, pre-COVID, I remember seeing that I'm looking at my lessons learned. Didn't get back to the candidate soon enough. He took another job. Didn't return the call to the client soon enough. They withdrew the offer, whatever. I mean, it's, 
I saw this pattern of me delaying not getting back to people. And I really, and I thought about what is that? I'm afraid. I'm afraid of hearing a no. I'm afraid. I, I still had rejection fear. And so I would look at certain trends and I would see is, and I would ask myself, is there some sort of character goal or virtue goal I can set that month to ameliorate that deficit, to fix it? And so it's just, I think self-awareness is key. And I think even doing something like that, Ben, even just documenting what was your greatest achievement and your greatest lesson that you learned, which is code for mistake uh, every day, and then over time you grow. So I think that uh, I don't consider myself a teacher of the business. I'm a student. I mean, that's how I see myself. I'm a student. I, I think when we think we've known it, when we think we know it all, I've got it covered. I don't need any more help. You know, I'm good. Okay, that's fine, but you're never going to reach your full potential. So that's uh, that's that. I think you, I think you re like really hit the nail on the head. There's actually a, a podcast episode going live tomorrow talking about where we spend some time talking about EOD, end of day review, and yeah. tracking it. And oh, that, that's called something. That's good. <laughs> that's free. <laughs> end of day. I love it. I love it. And it's like going through and like tracking like you know stuff like stuff like you know biggest lessons, some of your metrics. You know, did you get your workout in? How was your sleep? Did you take yeah. care of your body? It's great. Yeah. And it's I, I love that you're doing that because you can only figure out what you've been tracking. That's right. Myself, I can't remember what I did last week. If I, it's not written down, it, mm -hmm. that's right. Anything that can be measured improves over time. Uh, an interesting uh, vignette, when I was an able officer after my, my sea duty tour, when I'm in the process of getting separated, I was on a shore duty tour for about a year, year and a half. And I was a trainer at the world's largest naval base in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, teaching Deming management methods, total quality management. The Navy had an initiative in the early 90s called total quality leadership. So that's what I did then when I was at the age of 24, when you do know everything, I was an organizational development trainer and consultant teaching statistical process control. And that's also something that I brought into how I have taught people the business, that what are the things that you can measure? What are the ratios now? Now look at the ratios between your interviews and placements and your submissions to interviews to placement. If that's skewed one way or another, that gives us information. So you're absolutely right. I like that. The end of day review. That's great. Um, and so you also mentioned that like self-esteem and resilience is like a muscle. It's something you can grow. Talk about that. I think that it's something that, and it's a muscle. Let me talk about it in two points. When we cut our skin, the point where the skin is cut heals back stronger. When we break a bone, the point where the bone breaks heals back stronger. When we lift weights, we are actually tearing our muscles down. And we don't conduct the same training on the same muscle area every day. We take a break in between. Why is that? It's the healing that builds strength. So I think we look at it as a muscle. I think rest is what builds strength, uh, being self-aware and knowing that you're not skewed in one way that you're out of balance. I think that's one part of it. The other way is looking at it in terms of skills, that you can learn certain skills of overcoming adversity and the more you do that, the more effective you are. And you can then shorten that recovery time. For example, I've lost out on placements that have been worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. I had a deal that didn't close uh, last quarter that would have been about a 200K placement fee. And it took me about five minutes to recover because I've got the skills down of, okay, step one, step two, step three. Okay, I'm good. Back to the funds. Uh, and one, one, here's one tip. When it, whenever something happens to you that's not optimal, the perspective you need to have is, okay, the enemy has me surrounded. They can't get away this time. That's the attitude you have to have. Chesty Puller reference. You have to have that attitude of, I'm going to win. I'm going to be okay. Uh, there's uh, Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, writes about the Stockdale paradox. Vice Admiral James Stockdale who is the longest serving and highest ranking POW officer in the Vietnam War, that there's a paradox. You have to be keenly aware of how bad your situation is and be truthful with yourself. And when you're in the field in the POW camp, if you see a string, you pick it up and you save it because you may need that. But then you also know you're going to be okay. You have got this. You're going to be fine. And I think those are some of the things I've learned about 
building those resilience muscles, Ben, that uh, the good thing with recruiting is that, hey, there's lots of opportunities to exercise. And one thing I tell people, when you start seeing really weird stuff happen, like really weird stuff, that's not bad. It means you're getting expertise. It means you're getting time and grade. You're going to see weird stuff happen if you're in it long enough, so don't let it bother you. There's a way you can recover, but the first step is maybe that can be the solution to a problem you didn't know you had. I, know, I absolutely love that. And Scott, going back to the Scottsdale paradox, like um, that it, if somebody ever asked me like a quote or a book that's had a huge impact in my career, like I can't quote the exact paradox down to a T. Yeah. But one of the things that when I first read that, it just screamed at me was uh, they, he got asked before talking about the paradox was like, you know, who didn't make it out of Vietnam? That's right. And, and what he said? The optimist. the optimist. And I was like, wait, yeah. why the optimist? Like they're, the hope is like, the, they just, they didn't have the realization of where they were. And because of that, when their hope died, they did. Yeah. I think that that's a correct perspective for any adversity. And recruiting is built on adversity. And you have to admit that. And you have to go into it knowing that this business will deplete me from all the energy that I have. And that's just the way it is. But if you're aware of that, then you can take steps to make sure that it fills you, such as listening to podcasts like yours, reading, being around people that can support you, using the lens of resilience when a problem comes along and finding solutions that I'm going to take. This. So for example, I actually had three counteroffers take place in a day, Ben, years and years ago. I had a candidate, never forget, 11 o'clock in the morning. I've been thinking, what, why'd you do that? I'm going to stay here. Two other people. I mean, I, I almost thought about flying to Seattle to tell my candidate, no, don't do it. Uh, but, and I remember, I, and I joke about this. I say, my wife was knocking on the door of the bathroom, wondering if I'm okay. And I'm in there crying. I'm crying so hard that my abs are going to look so good tomorrow because of how hard I'm crying. And I remember at the end of it, I realized, wait a minute, these candidates, they're selfish. And they're just going to do what they're going to do. And that's true. So find out what they want and use that to, heart, to, to drive the deal forward. And it changed my whole perspective completely about placement. So at this point in time in the chapter, you've got something bad going on. Flip through it a few pages. What did you do with that? Maybe that adversity was a gift. Maybe you found a way to keep from having counteroffers happen as much because the sting of disappointment caused you so caused you to change because it's so bad when people are, are making placements they're popping champagne corks high fives fist bumps they're not thinking about gee what do i need to do to get better which is why that when and i gave a speech last friday to a group of ceos and i talk about using uh, your disappointments as a learning tool and here's some structured ideas on how you can take that sale you didn't make and create standard operating procedures around that what if that's the best thing to happen to you but I think that the recruiting business, it depletes you from energy. You just need to admit it and find ways to build strength and to replace that energy with positive things that work. I absolutely love that. Is there anything else that you'd love to chat about on recruiters reaching their full potential? I would say treat it like a disciplined sport. I think you need to look at this like you were a high-performing athlete. And there's a choice. Not everybody wants that. And I'm never going to judge anybody. Some people... They're okay. That's fine. There's lots of things you can do with this business. Some people, I knew a, a guy is a professional musician. He'd make placements when he needed money and he'd be playing his guitar. And that's good. There's lots of options and not one way is the right way. You need to be aware though, that if you put a hundred percent into it, you will get a hundred percent back. If you put 80% into it, you're only going to get about 40% back. I think there's a tipping point between 80 to 100 in terms of your energy and your commitment. But I think it's a sport. You need to think of this as a high-performance sport, the same way a professional golfer thinks about his or her career compared to the way I think about golf, where it's like, hey, driving range, This yesterday, I'm good. And I'm probably going to play 18 holes uh, Saturday morning, and I might even have a Bloody Mary when I'm doing it. And I'm just fine with that. Uh, but that's not how Roy McElroy plays. They treat it seriously. So you need to make a decision. Uh, what is it that's holding you back? And what are you willing to do to change that, to reach your goals? And then first, even also going beyond that, figuring out why do you want to do that? What are you going to get from it? What do you want to do with this? Why is this motivating you? Where do you want to go? And how do you want to get there? 
you know, I think that's the overarching rule right there, Ben. I absolutely love that. Awesome. Well, Scott, um, just kind of switching gears a little bit. Yeah. Um, you have a podcast, you have like all sorts of different ways that you have developed new business over the years. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk, talk, talk about some of those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I believe in leverageable assets, such as creating a podcast for my niche of recruiting. Now, it's the Rainmaking podcast. I launched that three years ago over COVID, July of 2020, because I thought, you know, I want to do something. I had my old Great Recruiter Training podcast that had been around since 2009. I took that feed and I dusted it off the shelf. And I have two objectives with that. One is I want to get law firm rainmaking partners, the people I recruit. I want them to stay connected with me without being spammy. If I had an email list I'm sending to attorneys, they're going to send me notes back, say, take me off your list, you spamming scum. I mean, that's just how they are. So I dangle that shiny lure of value with content that's going to help them regardless of them working with me or not. And I think anytime you produce content, my philosophy is that when I have someone on my show, as you've been on my show, uh, we start with, let's get to the point. Let's solve some problems. Our audience are nothing more than uh, the equivalent of hungry toddlers. And hungry toddlers don't care about getting uh, loving you back. They only care about getting fed. And so that's my philosophy with producing content is dangle that shiny lure of value. So I did that, and that's a leverageable asset because I produce it once and it's there forever. What I didn't realize was how much depth I would have in uh, building a brand. Two of my guests, I didn't know it. They'd co-authored books before they asked me to co-author a book, Rainmaker Confidential. I had a meeting two, th two three weeks ago with the, uh, the chair of a smaller firm, a 240 attorney firm, and their managing partner of the New York office and some other leaders. And all of them I'm sending a book to. With, with my signature. It was great meeting you. I look forward to working together because this is expertise. It's self-published, but it's still expertise. So this gives me credibility with my candidates. And I also, anytime you create any sort of content, don't just make money on it one way, make money in it three ways. And my voicemail messages to candidates, I tell them, I know you get calls from other headhunters. One thing that's distinct about me is that I'm a credentialed expert in business development. I produced the Rainmaking podcast and I've written books on that. How that helps you is that when you move to another firm, you need to understand that it's a good business opportunity. And I think this is worth at least hearing about. So I use that to build credibility. I had a chair of a big top 50 firm uh, call me, a co corporate chair. He said, I, I'm, I'm in my 60s. I'm not going to leave. But I wanted to call you and tell you I got your voicemail message and that was really good. You really got something. And I've, I've got proof of concept. So that's number one, leverageable resources. Do something once and find ways to make money multiple times. Number two, I would say get in front of your niche. Speak to the groups that have people, whether they're recruiting HR people within your niche. I don't like to deal with HR. Still build them as advocates. They will open up doors for you to the C-suite if they know you're going to make them look good. Get in front of groups like that. Start with trade associations. Look for trade associations that serve your niche. Reach out to the executive directors, offer to write something for them, offer to speak at their lunch meetings, offer to sit on a panel. Uh, I, I'd been speaking for a long time, but just until COVID hit, I really thought about doing that within the legal. I always thought, well, they don't want to hear from me. I'm not an ex-lawyer, but I realized there's a, lot of, there's a lot of value in sharing ideas that you and I know about recruiting to people that just don't think about it all the time. And so I've done that, and that's a leverageable resource. And then I think number three is realize this is disciplined work that you need to, uh, and fortunately with my experience, experience from the Naval Academy and then the Navy, I learned how to withstand long periods of extreme discomfort and, and be okay with that. You need to be okay with doing the work and being uncomfortable. Uh, so anyways, those are, those were a couple of the, the other points I had that I wanted to share with people, Ben. Awesome. And yeah, I'll have the link to his podcast uh, in the show notes. I know from the conversations I had with Scott, there he has gotten multiple deals from people just finding his podcast, yeah. and now he's the expert in the space because of that. Yeah, it's uh, and what I found, what I felt very comfortable with, and I appreciate you saying that, is that my show isn't about me; it's about my guests. 
and about my guests looking really good and about me getting information from my guests that's going to serve my constituents, the candidates that I really want them to hear. And the, the podcast is not specific to legal. It's agnostic towards an industry, professional services. So it helps people in the recruiting industry also. Awesome. And it, it, for anybody that's looking at starting a podcast, Scott just shared some great advice. Make the guests the star. Yeah. Just like you always do, Ben. And your show is great. I mean, I listen to it. There's so many good interviews that you have on here. That's, it's not a waste of time what you're doing, Ben. Well, thank you. I, I was joking around with uh, other people. I'm like, I, I'm not the star. The guests are the stars. Like, yeah. I'm here just to try to ask some good questions. <laughs> yeah. One, one interesting thing, I didn't even anticipate this with my show because I was interviewing a lot of BD coaches, business development coaches for, uh, for lawyers, even though the topics are malleable to other industries. I was actually creating a referral funnel. I didn't even think about that when I started it because I've got out of the 157, maybe about 50 of them are real one-on-one -on -one business development coaches that now they call me. I've got a group that wants to move. Can you help? Uh, one of them does conferences twice a year. I've spoken to two of them in front of managing partners of firms that are his clients. So it really gave me some surprising benefits that by taking a risk, putting myself out there, uh, it can do good things. Some great advice. Well, Scott, is there anything else that you would love to share before we jump over to the quick fire questions? I would say, think of this as a journey that's meant to be enjoyed. I've always believed that this is a character business. This business will cut you open and let you look deep inside of what you're really made of and you have a choice. And so it's just, just the way it is. I think it's a, it's a personal development opportunity disguised as a job. And that's something I really believe. I've been saying that for years. And that's kind of my whole perspective in coaching people. This is about not just closing deals. It's you growing in your spirit. Awesome. Well, Scott, is there any advice that you would love to give to a recruiter that's actually just getting started in the industry in 2023? Yeah, I would say come in early and stay late. Put the time in. Uh, start at 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning and, and quit at 6. You got to put time in. This is a job you can do in about 45, 50 hours a week. After, after that, there's diminishing returns in terms of the energy expended. But in the beginning, you got to learn. Uh, what I did when I first started, I was with that firm that had some training VHSs by Tony Byrne. And I would watch Tony Byrne videos and Steve Finkel videos. I would read sales books. So I would say, be a sponge. Uh, take advantage of anything free that's out there and just learn as much as you can. And the next question, I, I, you, there's a chance you might kind of reco recover an answer that you've already given, but I'm still going to ask it. So what advice would you have to recruiters that have been in the business for a while that are looking at growing and being more successful? I would say, be honest with yourself. Be honest where those deficits really are. It might not be something you want to admit to yourself. And uh, when you keep track of your losses and any sort of gain, that gives you perspective on where you need to grow. That's what I'd recommend is be aware and uh, be self-aware. Well, in talking about tracking, here's a question for you. Like, how do you actually track your stuff? How, how can I or how do I do it? Yeah. How do you do it? Yeah. I think the, the main sheet I use is the one I referenced earlier. And uh, I also will set my weekly targets. So I have my monthly goals and I've got my weekly targets. I call them targets because it's much more precise. And then my daily targets. And I'm old school where dry erase board, it works, or yellow sticky notes, it doesn't have to be fancy. And so I've got two more goals. I don't know if I'm going to hit those. Uh, I th I've got to get busy today for me to hit those. So uh, that's something I do. And I, I keep track of this every week. I think about, uh, and, and then also Sunday night, before I go to bed, I will write down my targets for the week. It's, it can't be done on Monday morning. You got to do it Sunday night. If you do it Monday morning, it's too late. Week has already started. <laughs> has there been a book that's been, had a huge impact in your career? I'd say it was that one book I mentioned by Pat Pearson. Another, there's two other books I'll mention. One of them is called Pitch Anything by Orem Claff. And he's an investment guy that's done pretty significant pitches for money. Uh, the audiobook is really good. I started with the audiobook, then I read the book, and I've listened to the audiobook probably twice, maybe three times. Also, and I happen to have this book on my desk, uh, Phil Jones, Exactly What to Say. Uh, Phil's been on my show twice. 
He's out of New York. He's English. And his book is great. I read this in 2017, I think, when it came out. And it's just really good, really good suggestions. Awesome. When it comes to artificial intelligence and recruiting, how do you think it's going to impact the future of recruiting? I think it will give people a lot more wisdom and increase the odds of effective execution because they'll be able to test it with certain ideas that they have and seek advice. For example, the first thing I ever did with that was I left my voicemail script. I wrote it in ChatGPT. And I got some really good ideas back from that. Anytime I have any sort of initiative, I'm going to take that mini business plan. Anytime I do anything, I'm going to do at least a one-page document, objective, you know, SWOT analysis, uh, action steps. I put it in chat GPT just to see what the answers are. And you get great ideas. Uh, anything that is dealing with people, and I believe that technology, the goal of technology is to increase our effectiveness in personal relationships with people, to increase the speed, to manage them via scale, and to increase our effectiveness with one-on-one, -on -one, because that's really where the answer is. Uh, but I think anything related to communication with other people, you can put that in chat GPT and get some suggestions. Uh, within our parish, I was a lay reader for the first time a few months ago, so I actually got 11 really good ideas from chat GPT about that, which meant a lot to me. Uh, you know, and so... So I think anything with communication with people, you'd be surprised how many good ideas that chat GPT gives you. I love it. I, have ch I probably access chat like multiple times a day. <laughs> That's great. I know. I know. Can't stop now. It's out there. Now, when it comes to your own personal success, mm -hmm. is there anything that you can contribute that to? I think it's just falling forward. It's being able to make decisions for me. You know, it's my faith, my family, and making good decisions. And uh, the way I make good decisions, it's, and like I said, there's a little bit of self-destructiveness in all of us. And you've got to experience the emotion of disappointment. You've got to feel it. But you want to feel it in three minutes or less. Get a journal. Write about that. Get it out. Have a counselor. Have a counselor if you need to. We all have issues we have to deal with. Everybody else, be real with yourself. But I would say, fall forward, you know, that it's going to happen. You're going to fail. Fall forward. There's, then there's a skill. Awesome. Now, Scott, if you can, everything that you've learned, everything that you've experienced, if you can go back to the very beginning of your recruitment career and sit down and talk to yourself, what advice would you give yourself? It would have been find a different recruiting company to join. Uh, people really, where people uh, have good leadership and there are some great firms out there. If, if I would have known what I know now, it would have been move to Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Texas, and join K Basin. Uh, that would have been the advice I would have given to myself when I started. Join a group of people that care about you, that have effective protocols that aren't going to mess around with the money. Uh, anytime someone joins my company, I say, I'm never going to lie to you and I'm never going to play with the money. If you make a placement and you leave, you're going to get paid on that. I've got a guy that has a commission payout next week. I even texted him last week. Just FYI, it's on the calendar. Because uh, I think at the end of the day, it's a, it's a character business. And if you're going to play with the money, if you're going to not pay commissions to people, man, you're, you're going to fail in other areas also. Uh, so that's what I would have told myself is find a different firm that has good values and good ethics and go there and stay there. I didn't even know this was a real industry. I mean, I just didn't know. I took, a, I took probably a hard route by trying to figure it out on my own. Instead of going to an established firm, keeping my head down, enjoying the work and staying there for a long time and then reaping the rewards. So that's, that's the advice I would have given to myself. Great advice. Well, before I go, let you go, Scott, is there anything else that you'd love to share with the listeners? No, I just say stay with it. And it's a great business and it will test you. It's not for everybody. And there's nothing wrong with taking a break, going and doing something else. Some people, they go in-house and then they come back to it. Other people, and there's nothing wrong with saying, it's just not the right fit for me. Uh, I've got a lot of respect for people that were in it and now they're working in-house. Some of them are my clients and they're close friends. I would say it's, 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 a, it's a good career that has an element of risk, that has an element of gamble to it. Where, uh, and the way I look at my job as a recruiter, I'm playing poker all day, Ben. 
this is a game and I've structured it. And that's the lens through which I look. That's it. I'm using game theory. Uh, how do I increase the odds? Here's an example. We've, we've got, because I've got a colleague that works with me, she's been with me over two and a half years. We've got eight deals at the closing or pre-closing phase. It's going to be a good year. And uh, all those come from her. I'm able to increase the odds of getting candidate flow by having somebody whose job is to tap shoulders of people for me. I'm able to use technology so that we can scale those conversations. I'm able to, and so there are key leverageable assets, like I mentioned earlier, that if you use those, you'll have quantum change just by making a few tweaks in a few key areas. Uh, I've had a lot of people help me with this. I can solve anybody's problems except for my own, Ben. I'm a mess, right? And so that's why I have coaches. Jordan Rayboy, that's the guy that helps me keep my head squared on, uh, on straight where he can tell me, don't do that. I'm like, yeah, I shouldn't do that. So I think, I think you got to have somebody that's, uh, that you're talking to that helps you. I think that's key also. But it's such a great business. I think that people, if they have the right attitude, if they do the right things, they're going to experience massive success. And that's something that I hope that they'll achieve. Awesome. Well, Scott, once again, thank you for coming back on the podcast. <laughs> and uh, for our listeners, if you are interested in the Placement Club, check out the link. There's a special link uh, in the show notes. And, you know, I, I love that you have such passion for this industry. I love that you have such a passion for this business. Yeah, this it really is a, a life-changing business. I mean, think about that. It's like, some people are one placement away from changing their entire lives. Absolutely right. Absolutely right, Ben. I mean, one good quarter can change your life significantly. And again, the question I'll leave people with is, what could you do in terms of your billings if you spent each hour of each day effectively and you knew you're not going to burn out and your relationships are going to stay healthy? What are you really capable of doing? That's the question people need to start with. And with that, Ben, thank you for having me here. It's great. I'm glad I didn't cry this time talking with you. And <laughs> but it's great. And, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for that and for your friendship. And it's great to live in the same community. And uh, Ben and I, we live in Richmond. Don't move here. It's horrible, you know. Don't, don't move here. We don't want it to get any more crowded. But anyways, I'm glad we can, we can hang out also socially, Ben. Absolutely. Well, Scott, definitely thank you for coming on the podcast and for the listeners until next time and let's crush it together.